annual report this month. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. County Sealer, Wayne Taylor. Is there any questions for the County Sealer this morning? Hey, thank you. Board of Elections, uh, Mr. Whitney, Mrs. McGahey. Any, any report this morning? <laughs> Would you come up, please? Yeah. Allison and I and the uh, Board of Elections in Albany have uh, put together uh, some specifications for uh, reviewing objections for petitions that we have agreed to adopt today so that they would be noticed to the candidates and the objectors so that they will know what the ground rules are uh, for the independent petition process. And those will be in place. Okay. Any questions from the, or comments from the board? Yeah, uh, well, I'll start with the committee. So I guess the question is, okay, can we see them? We don't adopt that. So we are just curious about. It's the state board of elections. Oh, okay. All right. What they use. All right. We'll get copies of the board. So I thought it was something. Mr. Perry? Well, quick off. You want to go? I mean, if I'm just trying to get this clear. So if these, it sounds like these are already in place by the State Board of Elections? Yes. So aren't you, don't they supersede? Don't you have to follow those anyway? I've always followed what the State Board of Elections puts out. And it's always been my theory that if it's good enough for the highest Board of Elections in the state of New York, it's good enough for any county board, and I don't see why a county board would second guess. So when you say you're going to adopt the State Board of Elections regulations, I would think that you don't need to adopt them. They're already our child, correct? I would say so. No. Anytime we get two commissioners to agree on anything, it's good. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Mr. Mary, I guess my, my question would be, was the process compromised? because apparently of the lack of agreement of what the State Board of Elections had already in place and in writing. And I thought that when we commissioners took the oath of office, that there was a representation that election law would be followed. And I'm asking this because I don't have a lot of information. I do read the papers. And it sounded like there was a compromise to the process. Uh, let me let me try and answer that by reading the most recent um, email from Anna Spizzaro, which is the Board of Elections in the State of New York. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, folks. Attached is a reworking of the doc Allison shared with us all last week. Please feel free to review, tweak, or otherwise make this your own, then adopt it. The doc mentions that various forms are attached. I hand it. You can use any of the sample we have sent you as models for your own samples. If you're missing a sample, let us know and we'll ship you one. <laughs> Keep in mind that your prima facie review is required to be done in the most timely way consistent with Regulation 6215.7. If you have any questions, please call at your earliest convenience. And I responded, thank you, Anna. This process is acceptable and can now be approved by our board at the next meeting, giving us sufficient time for the process to be adopted for use with rulings on the independent petitions, which was the guidance that we were given. Prior to today, 
we had not adopted as two commissioners a process. We had in place, from years before, a process. And that process was written and was available on our shared drive. Now, we disagreed on the process, whether to adopt it or adopt one of our own. We now have agreement on a process, which Allison gave to the State Board. The State Board tweaked and returned to us. And that is how they're adopted. Actually, boards of elections adopt their process. And so, moving forward from today, that will be the case. I have just one question on, um, normally, under law, if, if a level of government does not have a, uh, a policy or a law in place, then guidance for that goes to the next, that comes from the next highest authority. So if, for a zoning law in a town, if a town does not have any zoning law, it goes, uh, it goes to the APA or to the state or to the county for the zoning laws la lacking one. So I guess I'm questioning now, you, you said that the state had a policy here, but we did not have the county level. You want to adopt the policy, so lacking the policy, how come the state policy wasn't followed? No, this wasn't about not having policy. This was about not following any policy. Yeah. That's what this was about. You can have all the policies and procedures in place, and you can have them adopted, and you can agree to follow them, but if someone doesn't want to do any policy whatsoever, then they're useless. Yeah, I would just present the fact that uh, on the Essex County Board of Elections, we had a written policy. It had never been superseded by one of our own, so I would object to that characterization. It had never been used. But we don't need to argue it that was here. Illegal. It was an illegal process drafted by other commissioners long ago that had never been implemented. And in fact, if it had ever been implemented, it would have gotten those commissioners sued. And we totally agree on that. Okay, it was not our process. It was one in existence. Obviously, we have to fix going forward. Mr. Scott, um, not, not, not believe me, I don't even want to get involved in this. Um, I had someone run against me one year. He copied the names straight out of the phone book alphabetically, and I didn't challenge the petition. But anyway, the. Um, from what I've read in the paper, you were away, correct? This question has been asked to me by my constituents. You were out of town or wherever. You have a deputy, correct? Yes. Why would your de why would that responsibility not have fallen on your deputy? Isn't that why we have deputies when when I'm away, my deputy takes care of pertinent business that may come up. So I guess um, yes. my question is why. Why the delay? Why didn't the deputy step in and, and meet with the Republican commissioner and come up with a decision? That's an excellent question. I thought so. Uh, it kind of gets to the heart of what you read in the paper. Um, I have a deputy. She's a fine deputy. And I authorized her in writing at the beginning of the year to act on my behalf if I'm not there. In fact, we do this not every day, but occasionally. So the answer is yes, there was a deputy in place. It could have been acted on. What we had a disagreement about was process. I had only the process that we kept on our shared drive to reference. We never adopted one ourselves. So in the middle of that period, we disagreed about what to do. I said, and it's a, it's a legitimate disagreement. You can, you can argue either side. My position was, without a process, the one that was already in place and adopted should be what we use until we adopt our own. Allison argued the other side, which is, since we ourselves have not adopted a process, we can adopt one now. However, in our discussions, we never had that written process, actually until now. And that has gone through some revisions. So 
to answer your question, this was never about my vacation, quote unquote vacation. You know, I told my father that uh, I wouldn't be there that week and that uh, he said, fine, I understand. Business comes first. So I just have a on a process? Yeah. Yes, today we did. Oh, all right. Well, the only concern I have is, is, is the time frame passed for any court challenge to the decisions that were made on those petitions occurred. In other words, can someone challenge what the process that was used on the petitions right now? I'm not sure. All I'm saying is, if that's the case, then we should not be discussing this at all. Yes. That it should be a legal issue. Mr. Manning doesn't happen to be here, but if in fact there is a legal challenge to whatever process occurred, we should not be discussing this any further. Mr. Chairman, just, um, you know, I, I, I got to assume as a result of last week in the paper, uh, I was brought to my attention that during the uh, reorganization of uh, committees and subcommittees that I inadvertently did not put back on the committee or subcommittee list the Board of Election Task Force or the Frontier Town Task Force. So I just want everyone to know that as of today, uh, we will reactivate the Board of Election Task Force, which uh, is represented by uh, his co-chairs, Ron Moore and Jerry, or Ron Moore and Jerry Morrill. Uh, the members are Mr. Pleady, myself, Mr. Preston, Mr. Connell, uh, Joe Provancha, Dan Palmer, and the Board of Election Commissioner, Democrat Chair uh, Bethany Cosmer, and also the Republican Chair, uh, Mr. Galilla. And they will fall under and meet and report under public safety. So as of today, and it's my error that that did not get put on uh, the new committee, uh, put a committee list. And as far as the Frontier Town, it, that will um, also fall, on, that'll fall under finance. So. Um, that's all I have to say about it. Thank you very much. Since it's under public safety, I, uh, I, I think the point of discussion for the mission of that task force, um, and I would recommend this as a motion, to, if I can get a support from the floor, to develop and standardize the procedures that, uh, that the commissioners have agreed upon so that it's, it's open in the record and the Board of Supervisors um, have a chance to review them. It's on, it's on tap to I don't believe we have that power. Yeah, I was just I don't, that there's no way we have that power. It's, it's all, that's all right, though. It's, we discussed it. It's our intent to adopt those procedures, and so we will call a meeting today. We will adopt those procedures that will be in our minutes. So yeah. it is under our power to adopt those right. procedures, and the timing is right now because now we can get them out to the new petitions coming through. They're not doing something in the middle of the process. I, I would like to take a point, a uh, personal point right now and, um, and ask for forgiveness. I would like to ask for forgiveness in that a process issue somehow became politicized in the press. And my position was not to respond to rumor, innuendo, and unfounded statements. I'm pretty sure that some of the comments that were quoted could not have been accurately uh, reflected. Um, I know that nobody called me from this room, called me to ask what was going on. I know that the last time we stood here, you were uh, very, uh, very nice about saying that finally, after all these years, the Board of Elections was working smoothly. So I apologize uh, for, uh, and ask for forgiveness for any distraction that this process issue may have caused. Um, and, uh, and I, in return, also forgive uh, any comments that were made in the press which were inaccurate. Ms. Moore? I'm agreeing with Dan here. I don't think this should even be discussed because of possible litigation or whatever. Also, before, as co-chair of the new committee, or the revised committee, 
I won't be any part of moving any resolution or adopting any resolution until we saw it, until the county attorney saw it also, and until we find out we even have, I agree with Tom, that we even have the authority to do this. Because we're delving into political things with the Board of Elections. That's so exactly I would right. hold off on adopting anything right now until it's all brought up to I, 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 will, I will draw it, Terry, but okay. it was not my intent to politicize anything. No, no, I understand that, Sean. I'm not saying that. I'm everything. Yes, I'm just saying, until we know what's right, and what we're talking about, and the county attorney look at it, I wouldn't be moving anything right now. Mr. Just one more. Uh, Allison, or, or, uh, we'll get a copy of the procedures. Yes. Uh, the procedure when you guys adopt it. I'm just curious if one of the items under this, or that the commissioners don't take the week off prior to validating ballots, is that part of the procedure? I don't think the time off is a problem. I think the county law section 401 requires that if a commissioner is absent for some reason, the deputy That is deputy. In. Good. So Thanks. there shouldn't ever be a gap in the services that the Board of Elections provides. Um, as far as the procedures, those are the same procedures that I have already proposed. And they're the same procedures that the State Board of Elections in a conference call told us to use the following morning and sit down and rule. So, uh, for some reason, my counterpart has had a problem with this type of procedures from the State Board all along. So, and now we have them in writing. So why don't we go back to the office, adopt these, and we can move forward. Just call her. She did not interrupt you when you were talking. So please give her the freedom to speak what she wants to say. And I do think, and her, thank you. And I do think it's unfortunate that the Board of Elections, which had been doing fantastic, and we, we had gotten along the entire last two and a half years, all of a sudden that relationship ended. And it is very unfortunate. I would agree with that. Anything else for the Board of Elections? Thank you very much. Thank you. District Attorney uh, Sprague has been excused. She's in court. Emergency Services, Mr. Jacobs. Good morning. Um, the first thing I'd like is a resolution to uh, authorize a budget amendment to increase revenues and appropriations in the amount of $280,990 uh, into the radio project. Uh, if you want to know where that money came from, it's unanticipated revenue, but it's actually a payment from Verizon for 100000 for half of the uh, cost of the Buffy Mountain Tower. Uh, AT&T also made a, the same payment of 100000 uh, AT&T also paid us $51,457 for half the cost of the generator on Defiance. Uh, they also paid $9,421 for our Iman meters at Terry Mountain. And NYSEC has paid us $20,119.49 for the installation of ice shields on Terry Mountain. So those are all shared costs that we had worked out with our partners in this project. And uh, that money I would like transferred into the radio project because we have uh, work uh, transitioning all the antennas and equipment onto the new Belfry Mountain Tower off of the old one, and some work left at Terry. Uh, that leaves until the balance of, I'm trying to find it here. Seven hundred and forty seven thousand three eighteen in the radio project fund. So I'd like that moved forward. You want to make a motion? Mr. Arrington, second. Mr. Preston, discussion? Any questions? That balance uh, includes this transfer or is that Yeah, this transfer added into it, yes. We're still trying to define it more clearly, but that's where we're looking right now. Any other questions? Discussion? No question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries. Thank you. Okay, and so in saying that, moving that money in, I need uh, 
a resolution appropriating $5,908 uh, for the transfer of the UHF links off of the old tower onto the new one. Um, so that's $5,908. Uh, we need to move that UHF link over as soon as we can. Thank you. And uh, I did notice in the minutes a resolution 212 of our last full board meeting asking for an inventory of uh, railroad crossings. Uh, through some investigation, we have found that there's a um, rail crossing locator app on your, you can put it on your iPhone or your iPad, and that app would do far more than we could do. It, it has every private crossing, uh, every public crossing in just about the United States. It was the database is from the Federal Railroad Administration. So you can go to this, take this app, look it up. You can also look up the inventory of the crossing. That means the equipment that's on there, whether it's lighted, whether it's private. It also will track any accidents that have occurred on that crossing. So that, I think, could answer that, the resolution 212. Would you, would you mind uh, sending that to all the supervisors? I, I will send the link, but it has to be either on your iPhone or your iPad. I understand that. Yeah, so we can do that, yes. Uh, DOT, I believe, has that inventory. Um, they may, they they may Tom, and that's probably where they assembled this we went, we entire went, database. Yeah. It's a collective database. <laughs> a few years ago, we went through the installation, if you remember, down on Mullet Bay Road of a crossing with the lights and the, and the gates and so on. And the way the DOT regulations are written, because it was a private road, they would not do it. So we, we had to take the road, we had to take a section of that road over in order to, to accomplish that. And that's, so a lot of the issue is not only with the railroad, but a lot of these unprotected crossings are due to the DOT regulations. That, and I had this discussion years ago with, with Senator Little at the time, but, uh, but until those regulations change, it's going to be very difficult to try to get protected crossings on, on private roads, or like yes. going down in the canyon and so on. That is going to be difficult. It is. Okay, uh, let me see. I, I don't want to forget anything. Uh, so lastly, uh, there are members of uh, Essex County EMS here today, and I, I would like to give Patty Baja and uh, those members uh, a courtesy of the floor, if you would allow it, to speak about the state of EMS in Essex County. Like you to floor to Patty Baja? Just uh, let me just make a comment to Don before he goes goes yeah. way down. Uh, last week at full board, you and your department were recognized for your. Uh, efforts in the Lake Placid fire. Oh, so I just want to publicly thank you for being available, you know, after hours and uh, for my call to you. So, uh, you know, thank you. It means a lot to know there's going to be somebody out there to... Uh, thank to you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning. So I didn't know you hot and I know we've been sitting here for a little bit but um, I think this is an extremely extremely important topic and um, I came to you guys I think it was like two years ago now um, and we've had some discussion last year that um, the state of EMS in this county is growing more fragile every year um, to the point where you know we've seen one agency um, um, have to close EMS wise and I just want to bring up some topics. I talked to um, Supervisor Gilliland about this and I just think it's extremely important. First of all I'd like to recognize um, the EMS providers that are in the um, audience today that came in. Um, most folks have to work during the day so it's tough to get representation to the meetings but um, there are a few, quite a few in the audience. Um, so what happened, we had a SS County Association meeting about a month ago-ish now, and every agency was represented at that meeting except for three, Wilmington, Sable Forks, and somebody else up north. Anyway, um, and we had a really active discussion on the whole um, EMS coverage of the county, and um, really has some quite frank discussions on um, how fragile this whole system is. 
So I'm just going to give you one example of many. Um, about two or so weeks ago, um, Essex and Willsboro went automatic mutual aid to us to help cover their town um, because two of their key players were out during the day. Night coverage was okay, it was during the day. Um, and actually one of those persons I think is now out with some medical issues, so they're down to really one person covering out there. That was fine, we had no problem covering that. If we went to um, that town during the day, I would have left my town uncovered, E-Town Lewis uncovered, so we would have had to automatic mutual aid with Westport and or Keene, depending on where the call was. Um, if this had been during September when the key people were working uh, back at the school in September, Westport would not have been able to move an ambulance either, probably. So you can see where if one agency really has an issue, it's a huge trickle-down effect. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think every single agency um, is having some type of coverage problem. Uh, right now. And uh, Keene Valley, for an example, is automatically mutual aiding Keene during the day to help cover that town. Um, my agency is having great difficulty covering weekends, still having to hire per diem staff, and we still have holes in our schedule. Mariah, if Mariah loses um, a couple of key players down there, they're not going to move an ambulance. Um, the EMTs in the agencies are just dwindling. We don't have those as replacements. Through a whole bunch of this already. Um, just um, not very long ago, um, there was a car accident where um, there was just a driver and an EMT that responded to the call. And if you have to backboard anybody in the back of the ambulance, as some of you guys know, you have to have a second person in the back. If that person decides to vomit, you can't roll the board easily by yourself, so it's um, jeopardizing care a little bit. Um, not, um, they thought they were going to get help when they got to the scene. Um, and I um, know of a, f um, I don't want, you, don't want to hear that um, someone's called into 911 breathing, and by the time a mutual aid agency gets to that person from another town, uh, which could be um, a quite a transport that they find somebody in full arrest. That person certainly could have died anyway, but we're not giving them really a benefit of the chance if we can't um, move an ambulance pretty quickly. I really don't know what the answer is, and um, what we were coming to this committee for, or this committee for today, was to ask for some help. Um, we know it's a combination of a lot of stuff. We know Randy is um, some of the guidelines or criteria that's needed. Um, uh, there has been, it's not for the lack of us trying to do recruitment and retention. Uh, Keene Valley, for an example, knocked on 151 doors and gained two people. They literally went out to people's homes and gained two people. Um, so it's not for the lack of trying. I think the tax cap is part of it. Um, Screenlink can attest to the fact that their budget for EMS is gone up to, is it 200,000, you guys? 200,000. Um, so us volunteers that are trying to run um, an agency like a business, because quite frankly, the number of hours we put in um, EMS-wise as EMS captains is significant. So if we can't um, get, you know, because of the tax cap, if we can't get funding to help increase the money that we need, which obviously you can see can be up to $200,000, then it's hard for us to um, get the, the coverage that we need. So that's, that's a huge issue. And the EMS providers that are working to make a living at this job, um, my paid person is getting about $15 an hour. Um, what's minimum wage right now? And we are paying for benefits, which is um, a plus, but she needs to work other positions just so that she can, you know, have a um, you know, good income. And those that are running right now um, all the time, quite frankly, are getting tired up because, again, there's no one that's coming in. They need to be taking the calls because these people are extremely dedicated. They are wanting to move an ambulance. Um, so it's not for the lack of wanting to go. They just physically get so they keep into it. And then some of us who want to have a life outside of EMS also is um, it's kind of tough to get a vacation in. But on, So what we're coming here today for is we need some help from you guys. It needs to be a local level help. Um, we really tried to get after the state a little bit, and Randy can tell you all his um, his activity with that. But we, there, I'm telling you, there's going to be a catastrophic event, and someone's going to die um, because we can't move in on some time in there, and we're having to go to the next agency to cover that town. And I would. Just like to, I don't know if any of the people in the audience want to say something, but um, 
if that's a possibility, that'd be awesome. I don't, they came not expecting to talk today, I don't think, so. Any questions from Mr. Scott? Yeah, if we've had this discussion now, and Mariah also, and as you pointed out, you know, you got two people, if either one of those people aren't available, then we're pretty much down. Um, the, um, if you had EMTs even, are there EMTs available? Right now, if you had positions open, no. are there trained, certified EMTs available in the county? Um, I'm getting my EMTs out of Wilmington, on Sable Forks, and Plattsburgh for my weekend coverage. So, um, I think t the answer is probably not so much. I guess where I'm, where I'm going with this is um, if, and I do understand the um, the, the impact when. One isn't available in one town, it impacts the surrounding communities also because if they're called, now they have no coverage and it just, like you said, the trickle down. But, um, but if you, if we had, we, no, we won't even get into the money end of it at this point, but per diem EMTs, for instance, that covered on-call areas, okay, Willsboro's gonna have somebody out today, can you be on call? Mariah's got to have someone out. Can you say you had four or five located throughout the county? Um, I don't know if that would be a possibility. The, um, I mean, we just hired per diems for to answer the uh, the 911 calls. Um, you know, they can answer calls all day long. If you don't have an ambulance or an emergency vehicle available to go get them, um, you know. It, so I, I, you're right, Patty. It is. It's. It's a huge problem, and I, you know, I certainly don't have the answer, but it's a problem that's going to impact all. Already, it uh, has impacted all 18 towns. Um, so. I agree. Um, when the one right now is covering uh, Crown Point, and if they have a transfer right now, they call you. Your I might mutual aid depending on where it is in their town or Ticonderoga. So it certainly does affect every every single town. You know, I don't know what the what the answer is. I don't know if um, you know if a committee to look at this is an answer. Um, and I told you guys when I talked to you folks like two years ago, those that were here then, I said that you need to go back to your towns and have a real frank conversation with your agencies and say, hey, if you're doing okay, that's awesome. What are we going to do in the next three, four, five years? And if you're not doing so awesome, how can we help? Um, somewhere I've heard even that um, a town employee might be hired um, and be used as a driver for an agency. So it's, it's stuff like that. Sean? I guess uh, this has been an extremely frustrating process and for reasons that I honestly can't figure out, I can't get anyone at the state level to listen. And it's not just here, it's everywhere. When, when we go to the Association of Counties, I mean, we're on a bus and everybody, there was people talking about it from out in Lewis County. So I guess, I mean, I have written numerous times, we had Lee Burns up here, um, from EMS, Department of Health there, and it, we've went nowhere. And I really don't get that because there's so many things that tie into this. Number one, dialing 911 and not getting an ambulance or not getting one until 25 minutes later. Right. Number two, with the tax cap, I don't understand why this doesn't bring things to light to people. There's places that have raised their budget $200,000 for ambulance coverage. Why this doesn't catch somebody's attention, but for whatever reason it doesn't. And then to kind of refer to what you said, Tommy, there aren't enough EMTs out there because we're man now in Wilmington during the day, seven days, but if somebody calls in sick, we can't fill the hole. Right. And that creates the issue. And we are having issues on weekends finding enough people to cut for our coverage. I honestly don't know what the answer is, but what kind of feedback, if anything, I mean, you deal with other agencies, uh, I mean, different uh, within the, the region and also on a state level, are, are you getting any feedback from these people? No, one of the biggest things they are doing, obviously, is um, making sure that they can bill. So you're seeing agencies in our county even, like Keene, for an example, pulling away from their fire department so they can start billing, um, which will infuse some money into it because 
Um, we can't get it out of the towns because of the tax cap, pretty much. So that money is being infused, um, and we're going to hire people. And if you um, look at some of the towns that are, that are hiring, um, like, for example, some of the Screen Lake hires, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, are coming out of, like, Warren County, correct? Yeah. So she just says some are coming from Albany. So, um, I mean, we keep chewing and chewing. I mean, maybe it's time to get the wagons in a circle yet again, um, put a few people together, and, and uh, maybe with Mr. Farabee we can go and visit Dan Steck and Betty Little and, you know, some of the contacts we have with the governor's office and try to get it elevated yet again. I, I honestly don't know what else to try. I mean, I really thought that, you know, some of the things I did might get somebody's interest or attention or anything, and it hasn't. I mean, they just seem like, well, you know, go out and hire someone. Well, really? <laughs> so so how do you go from, you know, taking double your budgets? And that's what people are doing. Right. You know, it, it, it's it's just unbelievable. Right. And it is it is a real crisis. There's no yes. doubt. And we've talked before. I mean, I, somebody, you know, with more financial wisdom than myself, I mean, would have to think about a county EMS system. And I don't know as rural as we are how that plays out and how you get everybody to play to contribute. Because uh, I'm not sure how that works out. It's very problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we are so big. Um, I mean, obviously, if they need an ambulance in Newcomb, and uh, that's not good. Yeah. You know, if, if you're coming from an Irver or someplace, so. If you look at the money that is the people that are paying um, for their service, um, it's it's a like you said, it's a huge amount of money. Would that could that all be put in the one? payer spot and be able to, you know, get some service out there. I don't know. Iron Man, I'll just give you an example. Iron Man, uh, the morning of Iron Man, I get a call that their EMT called in sick and they weren't sure they were going to be able to uh, get an ambulance out to the swim. That would have held up all of Iron Man that day. They really rallied and came through. They were awesome. But that's, you know, just an example. And that's the other thing is we are... Uh, covering some of these big events, which brings revenue into the county. So, you know, I, I really, really talked to Iron Man for next year saying, you know, we may need to start looking at bringing in paid service from other places. Because yeah. yeah. they can't leave their towns uncovered. I mean, I'd certainly be willing to set on a, a small group to start to push again. I mean, I, I see it. I see it happen, and I hear of it happening everywhere. And not to money the waters, but I think... I'll go on the record. This is my personal opinion. I think fires in the worst is in the worst condition. Um, I, you know, there are times when they won't, can't move a fire truck. Also, and um, what is a little annoying, and I no disrespect at all of the fire departments, but they can give you a budget, and it's my understanding that you have to approve that budget. Am I correct? If it's a fire district, district, you do right. If it's a fire district, the commissioners set that budget. The town boards are the cap that have no say in that. So, and they may be doing how many thousands of dollars, and we're doing way more call volume than those you, guys. You are. can do an ambulance district, which can do the same thing. Right. Taxing authority. I mean, you have to get right. the approval to get. And that may be what we need to look at. Well, we're we're but Essex and Willsboro are in the middle. Of, we're going to be. In the, middle, in the process of forming an ambulance district. We want to do a combined ambulance district, but we have to form two separate ones and then a year later combine them. Yeah, um, the process is, process is crazy. Antiquated and crazy. Mechanical. Yeah, I want Dan, Dan Palmer and myself, we, we've talked about this for years. And apparently under county law, we're not allowed to form a district. When you form a countywide district, the hundreds of millions of dollars of exempt properties that are out there contribute towards those costs. So in other words, right now, the radio system would be a good example. There's a lot of property out there, people that own property that don't, aren't paying a dime towards the cost of that radio system. They pay nothing towards the cost of a lot of services that this county provides. I think, if, and I've had this discussion with Betty Little before, if we were allowed to form a county-wide district, the cost to have paid EMTs and so on would be minimal if you had all of your assessed value contributing towards those costs, correct, Dan? 
I mean, and that so that's a huge problem. Is that you've got? Um, I forget what the exempt ratio is on our roll within this county, but I know two billion dollars worth of exempt property. How much? Two billion. Two billion dollars. Now, you pick that. You pick those exemptions up just on the cost of the radio system. The impact that it's going to have on that tax rate is going to drop significantly. And I mean, so these are things that the state, they want this 2% cap of. We're providing a lot of services out there that there's a lot of exempt properties aren't paying a dime towards it. Yet, they're receiving the benefits of it. Um, Mr. Kim. I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> this problem came to Newcomb probably earlier than most. Our, our uh, fireman's budget seven or eight years ago was $50,000. <laughs> Next year it'll be over 300, and we had to go to fully paid EMTs. Nothing is more frustrating than to sit there in your office and hear that whistle go and go and go and go, and nobody answers it. It's very frustrating. So you have to bite the bullet. You have to bite the bullet. And in Newcomb, we're in good shape. Yeah. We're in good shape right now. But if we took those four ladies over there, red T-shirts on away. Uh, instead of paying two hundred thousand dollars, it'll be four hundred thousand, and we will have a townwide ambulance district, which will be in effect on January first, twenty sixteen. Uh, and it's only going to be a matter of time that we have a fire department that'll be paid to. We used to have fifty members and ten, fifteen people waiting to join, and I think now they have twenty-two members in the fire department. And there's days when they can't roll a truck out of there because they don't have a, a person qualified to drive it. They've made so many restrictions on becoming a fireman that uh, you, you can, uh, a heavy equipment operator who can run any machine made can't legally run a fire truck. So it's, it's, it's coming and it will, and I, I'm sure we're only going to be a year or two. It's happened in other towns that went and tried it for 12-hour uh, shifts, seven days a week. Uh, a friend of mine on the town board, Scattercope, they went a couple of years and but it's happened all over. You, you lose a couple of key players, and, and most of we've got a driver down there that's over, over 80, a volunteer, who just do not have the, the people, they don't have the time or the interest. One thing that I, that, and it's, it's evident to me, you know, dealing at the town level and, and with two town level and stuff like that, that this problem is bigger than the, than, than the individual town's ability to solve it, I think. We need to attack it at the county level, and probably starting with, uh, another, as, as Mr. Preston said, another attack in Albany to um, and with the, uh, our elected officials and with the, uh, the, the state to, um, you know, to, to keep fighting for it and looking for another, another type of solution, whether it be a countywide district or something. Um, and my recommendation is we, you know, we, we form a group to. Uh, to, to take, take up that task. Mr. Gardner. Uh, just to echo what Patty said, we just, as you know, we lost our, probably one of our main EMTs, and it might be for good. I know. And uh, this is a real problem. As you know, our budget is 200000 that we propose. And it is a serious, serious problem. Uh, really. It does. Because when people call, you know, a lot of our call volume is not life or death, but when that call does come in, and um, it is a time-sensitive call, and we can't move an ambulance, you know, that's, that weighs on everybody. It weighs on the dispatchers. It weighs on your, you know, you folks. It weighs on us, because we're trying to do the best that we can do. So um, it is, it's a huge deal. start out with just a couple of comments on uh, the previous emergency services issue in EMS. Uh, I started Ken Goodspeed. If, if any of you remember Ken Goodspeed, uh, he hired me a lifetime ago. 
And at that point, our radios in our cars, we had a three-channel radio that went through state police. With an emergency channel that, well, you don't touch that unless you have to. Scratchy transmissions, if you were more than 10 or 15 miles away from the state police station, radios were, were obsolete. The radio system we have now is clear. It's probably better quality and transmissions than you have on a, a cell phone. Uh, it's phenomenal. This new system, I have to say, is, is really done a world of good for the county. As far as the EMS goes, I know my officers, uh, they're not everywhere, but I know they make it a habit. If they hear an EMS call, they try to go and help. They can be lifting, they can be manpower. We did, uh, well, I had one officer commended for a save in Osable Forks. She got there in time to start uh, CPR. But you can't count on the officers to be where your emergency calls need to be. If they hear it, they'll go, they'll help with what they can. We're trying with that, but I, I, again, I, like Mr. Preston, I don't have any idea what the answer is. Now, the reason I'm here today is to ask for a resolution of non-support. The last minute of the uh, legislative session, there was a bill went through that basically, uh, we've been dealing with the ACLU for a number of years on this, this issue of the shackling of pregnant females. Our existing policy at, at our facility is any inmate is medically screened on intake. Medical then tells us what their status is as far as shackling, as far as anything else. If they have a breathing difficulty, they're tagged that, that we can't use chemical uh, OC or any chemical agents. If they have a disability, they tell us whether we can use a shackle or not. The point is, it's done in-house with people that know what they're doing. The legislature pushed this shackling bill through at the last minute, basically adding additional time and training for my officers who do transports every day. Now I have to bring them back in and retrain them once a year for something that they do every day. It, it's like if I told you you had to take a driver's test once a year. You drive a car every day, you know what you're doing. Under this bill, we have to tell the females if they're pregnant, they can't be shackled. Uh, Article 500C of the correction law says, I am responsible for taking and keeping any inmate legally entrusted to my care. Under this bill now, there are situations where we take that female to a doctor's appointment and we have to leave the room. We can't be there for security, but we're responsible for security. In the past two years, I mean this is not something that happens a lot in Essex County, the past two years I've had seven pregnant females in my facility. We haven't, knock on wood, we haven't had one give birth while they were in custody. But of those seven, Five were in on drug charges. One was a parole violator, a burglary, promoting prison contraband to inmates, a fugitive from justice, uh, possession of a controlled substance, possession of a hypodermic instrument. Those are people that have a drug issue. Those are people that need to be watched and restrained in some way, shape, or form. Like I said, we don't, if a, if a woman's eight months pregnant, obviously we're not going to put leg irons in a chain and whatnot. But if they're four to six weeks, we're aware of it, we're going to deal with it accordingly. Under this bill, it says, no, nah, no. If I restrain any pregnant female, then I have to justify fully in writing, and I have to notify the governor, the temporary president of the Senate, the minority leader of the Senate, the Speaker of the Assembly, the Minority Leader of the Assembly, the Chairperson of the Senate Crime Victims, the Crime and Correction Committee, and the Chairperson of the Assembly Correctional Committee every single time we use restraints. This is adding a pretty big burden on us in addition to the additional training time for people doing what they do every day. This issue came out of the uh, Sheriff's Association. It's pretty much spread statewide and I know to date, as of two weeks ago, 
seven counties have passed this resolution that I'm proposing, and a very high number are going to their committees this month for the same purpose. It's done. It's, it, the Assembly is there. The Senate is there. But we're asking for a resolution of non-support saying, when you do these things, please talk to the people that know what we're doing and ask us our opinions. I mean, we could have very easily changed some minds there if they had asked for opinions. So my request today is for this resolution of non-support. I think I provided you with copies of it. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Cosmo, did this bill go through the Senate? Yes, it did. I don't know how the, the Senate voted. Unfortunately, I didn't get that vote. Um, unfortunately, in the Assembly, there was only three no votes. It passed the Senate? It passed the Senate uh, June 23rd. So what brought this bill to the The ACLU has been working on this for years. I, I don't know. I know for probably the last four or five years, I continually get follow requests from the ACLU. How many pregnant females? What is your policy? How do you restrain them? What kind of issues have you had? How many injuries have you had? And I send them the one line in their policy that says they're medically reviewed and recommended. We've had no incidents. That's only move us. I, I can't move it, but I just got a question. You get a call at a, at a home, and a lady just beat her husband with a baseball bat. You're going to arrest her, take her away. She's a, I'm pregnant, so then you can't you can't tie her up. You got to let her be on you. If I do, if I if I do, then it comes back into this whole big long reporting and justification process. And again, we do in-service training every year, but this is going to add a whole new component, and they haven't come through and said any idea of what training is required. Just, you need to retrain your people in transport. Right. Well, why people do transports every day? Hi, right, Mr. Morrow, moving and seconded by Mr. Blades. Any discussion? Mr. Morrow. Just listening to this and seeing what the sheriff had sent through to us, it sounds like it's the same unfunded mandate as the SAFE Act, and the state passes these things. Even worse than unfunded, they're trying to do our professional people's jobs, but they don't know what they're doing. I'll go on record saying that. They've never been in this situation. Everything and everybody that the sheriff just read those positions off have never been in any of these situations, yet they want to act like they know what they're doing. We're regularly told by the State Commission of Correction that blanket policies are bad policy. That we can't have a blanket policy in a correctional facility. We need to, to individualize. And then we're handed a blanket policy here. Any other discussion? No question. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Sheriff, well, you had one other thing too about the uh, generator. Uh, <laughs> There's progress being made. Uh, I talked to Jed last week, and there was a number of issues that they did find. Uh, some fuses and some issues. I don't. We haven't been in a situation to know if it's going to work again. I, I don't know. And I will say, you know, Jed and Chris are. They are doing above and beyond anything that they really. They're doing phenomenal jobs, but it's it's a mess that they were handed and decided to figure out where the issue is. Thank you. Just to follow up that a little bit, we did have Cat come up and do some tests. That there are some things we needed. We needed new batteries. Those are being put in. Um, there is some switching issues within the generator itself. Uh, one of the other things they recommended, which our generator currently does not do, our generator does a startup, but does not do a full load startup. So apparently there's some device that you can put on the generator and force it to do a full load um, test. So we're looking at that as well, that although it's a fairly expensive piece of equipment, um, we are looking at that. So. It's frustrating because they come in and they work on it and they change, a, a, and this is years back, they would change a switch. <coughs> or they would make some change to it. And they test it and test it and test it and it works fine every time. Six weeks later, the power goes out and it doesn't work. I mean, do we, do we test now? Generator? I mean, yes. that's something that's done 
monthly, weekly, weekly? Do we run under fall law? But it's not. It both. cycles every week. It cycles every week, but uh, what Caterpillar rolls. said is it's not cycling not under fall law. Right, yeah. And you have to have a special piece of equipment that forces it to, to cycle under full load, which is what we're looking at. And it was like $7,000 is their proposal to install that device. You can, you can put a transfer switch in and do it manually. I mean, that's the way we do it at the, did it at the prison, the way we do it on our <coughs> pump stations and so on. You just shut down your line, the generator picks it up, and you get out of schedule and do it. Yeah, every I know that. I know that Jed has the exact process worked out to manually switch it over um, so we will not be in a position where we wait four or five hours for it to switch over so if Jed gets there he can now force it to switch over but um, we would like to get it to the point where it does it itself where it's supposed to. Because unfortunately Jed's got to come to that point. Yes. And it is a procedure. I, I talked to some of the people that worked on it said, can my officers do this switch over? And they strongly recommended against it. Just for the fact that if they forget one switch and go to another one, we would fry equipment all over the building. And I don't want that responsibility. Anything else for the sheriff? Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you. Probation? Do it, baby. Anything for uh, probation? Thank you. Public defender, Ms. Patel. Good morning, everyone. Well, I think I mentioned this last time, but here's your opportunity to have input on state policy. Again, on August 26th, right over here in the county courthouse, the State Office of Indigent Legal Services is holding public hearing, uh, taking comment on eligibility standards for assignment of counsel in New York State. And part of the Harrell hearing lawsuit, uh, part of the settlement was to put in place guidelines for uh, eligibility for counsel by October. So I plan on attending and uh, giving my two cents to the state, but I think I had a um, conversation with uh, Mr. Damola. He was asking about assigned counsel issues, and I mentioned this, and I think he's going to put it in the paper. So if you have any constituents who are uh, aficionados of assigned counsel issues, tell them to come to this hearing. Uh, I can give a couple copies of this flyer to anyone who wants it. Um, it's, I guess, speak now or forever hold your peace. So, um, second thing is, well, I guess it kind of dovetails with the sheriff, but um, in probation, the alternative to corrections initiative that the program in our county, I guess it is, we now have a few people who are released under that program. Uh, you keep people out of jail, then you don't have to worry about shackling anyone or caring for them while incarcerated. And I don't know if uh, pregnancy or medical issues is a factor on the uh, checklist for um, ATI candidates, but again, if you have any conversations with your justices, I would push this program. Uh, we are obviously for any program that keeps our clients out of jail, but uh, it is also good for the bottom line across the county uh, for the sheriffs. And that's one more bet, I guess, that they can run out to another agency. But, and then finally, I will be out for the last, from September 11th for the end of the month from military duty, they're sending me uh, overseas to the Middle East. So I'll be keeping the world safe. Any questions? Anything for the public defender? Um, Brandon, can we get a copy of that so we're reminded of uh, when that hearing is? Absolutely. And I can give you a copy or I can give a copy to the chairman for... I'd be kind of curious if I can be there to just listen to what's being said. The other question I have for you, and I really hate to open the can of worms because Roby's going to kick me right in the shin, but... <laughs> as far as the family court 
Yes. What's your opinion? Do you think we would be better off if we hired someone in the public defender's office? I, I, I have seen how convoluted that gets over there, oh, where yeah. the children have an assigned attorney, the defendants have an assigned attorney, social services has an assigned attorney, and just a case that I knew personally, um, the assigned attorney for the children was coming out of Glens Falls, and from what I was told, it happens on a regular basis. So I had briefly talked with Dan Palmer about this when we as were looking at this budget coming. In your opinion, do you think there'd be too many conflicts? Do you think we'd be better off in the long run having at least one public defender that's handling family court? Uh, as I used to put it this way, of all my colleagues in the United States, in New York State, we're the only office that doesn't do family court and people uh, are in awe and they are jealous of me because I don't have to, a family court caseload. That's because no, any way you look at it, every county that studied assigned counsel versus or a public defender versus assigned counsel is it's usually a third to half to sometimes three quarters ex as expensive per case than a, a assigned attorney. We probably would still have conflicts. It's inevitable, but my estimate is we could uh, probably take on at least a third of the family court caseload. Um, that includes appeals also. And we already have all the necessary infrastructure, the case tracking, the conflict um, means for determining conflict. So other than, and also there's state grants that could be available as well. The only thing that would uh, enable us to do that is just, a, I think, a one word to change the county law authorizing us to take family court assignments. And then under, under the 18B law, if the county's bar plan for providing signed counsel includes providing it through the public defender's office, uh, then the family court judge is required to assign in accordance with the plan. So there's always going to be a need for assigned attorneys from uh, the local bar. We wouldn't take every, we wouldn't take any significant amount from them, but we could at least put a dent in that bill and be able to apply for grants to help alleviate. Well, once I got a better understanding of what's actually taking place, I had briefly that discussion with Dan Palmer, and I really think it's something we should, I, I, you're going to find it hard to believe that I'm looking to hire somebody, but I really think in the long run it saves us money. And I think we should be taking a real serious look at that with the budget coming up. I, if that's acceptable to the board, if they think that that's a direction we should explore, because from what I just got enlightened to here in the last few months, it's it's quite mind-boggling. And then to see the dollar amount, it's, it's basically the family court assigned counsel is where we're having an issue. I personally think we'd be further off in the long day. Do you want to elaborate, Mr. Palmer? Or no? Yeah, you know, I don't disagree with that. I, you know, I said all along that this was a this was a, an ongoing issue that um, we originally formed the public defenders local law. Um, there was a lot of political pressure at the time that you, you had to understand we were going from a complete assigned counsel program to a public defender system, and the, and the compromise, so to speak, at that time was to split the public defender's office between criminal and family court and leave family court in the assigned counsel um, portion of the how the cases were handled. Um, I don't disagree that that's, um, if we had some, we can make, I don't, you'll never get rid of it in the science right. there's simply too many conflicts um, to, to do that, but I think you could make a dent in, in what it cost by um, doing that. Now what that's going to require is it's going to require that you're going to have to revise the local law that, that um, set up the public defender's office and extend that ability to do um, family court work um, based upon uh, if you choose to hire some individuals within the, within the program. Other counties handle it differently. Um, Clinton County does a contract um, for services um, with um, outside legal firms that handle a, a preset amount of cases, I think, per month. Um, and that's another option you could look at. But um, if I are, that the contract that Clinton County uses is contrary to the county law. There's there was some litigation in other counties, but. No one's pushing an issue up there yet. 
it's a, I guess it's a matter I know, of time. Dan has, Dan has brought that up a couple of times. I do. I am aware of this. So what, would, what, would, what would it take to move this process forward? Your you, vote. <laughs> it would take a, you have to introduce, you have to get Dan Manning to do a revision to the local law. You need to introduce, hold a public hearing. Once you hold the public hearing, if you revise that local law to include that the public defender's office can handle uh, family court assignments, then you would then, um, once that passed, you then could hire somebody to do that without the public defender's office. It's not, it's not an overly complicated process. Um, there well, will be. I think we should. There will be a room. I for. think we should take a serious look at it for yeah. sure. I don't disagree. Obviously, it was overly complicated for you for three years. I didn't hear you saying it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dan, I was wondering on this um, hearing if if maybe you might. Um, write a position on behalf of the, top, the Board of Supervisors rather than any one of us go. I would, I would rather that the state be aware of the position of the entire board because I think we all are unanimous in our, our position uh, with regard to um, the issue that Brandon was talking about. Okay. And I can work on that. You know, on behalf of us. Yep. You know. Thank you. And then to just back up, then I would put a motion on the floor that we investigate um, the feasibility of higher change in the local law and hiring a public defender for family court cases and get the process moving. Okay. So the, mo the motion to start the process for, for amending the local law and to hire a uh, public defender based on a recommendation of Tampa County Attorney. Yes, and I, I think that through the process it will get flushed out if it makes sense or not. Motion on the floor to is there a second? Mr. Harrington, thank you very much. Any further discussion tomorrow? I'd also, and I'm sure Dan's going to do this, I'm sure that the public defender's office is not going to do all this with the same amount of employees they have. Oh, no, they will not. So I would like to see what the difference in cost is, too, and with the benefits and everything else you're going to have to have <clears throat> compared to what it is now. Questions or discussion? Meeting none. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Thank you. Anything else? That's it. All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Anything else before, come before public safety? Two minutes. Economic development. Adjourned.